I think we are ready to go. So hello everyone, welcome here today. My name is Yan Sheng and together with me is Sekulon and we are the co-presidents of the Trinity College Science Society. And this is our fourth talk of this academic term. And today we are very honored to have Dr. Hyde Ibrahim with me, uh, with us to share, uh, to share about her research on the real-time study of roaming molecular fragments in photodissociation reactions. Dr. Ibrahim is a senior research associate and project manager uh, at RNS. Sorry, I cannot re really read the French words. <laughs> I couldn't keep the, um, the full name, but the abbreviation is RNS in Canada. And, and the topic of her talk today is going to be uh, a molecular movie. So this is just a very quick introduction from me. And I think that's all I have to say. And the stage is yours, Dr. Ibrahim. Thank you very much for yeah, your very kind introduction and the nice invitation to this very special event for me. My name is Heidi Ibrahim. I'm from the Institut National de la Recherche Scientifique in Quebec in Canada, and from ALS, the Advanced Laser Light Source, which is a laser user facility. So I will be talking about a molecular road movie, um, and I will certainly explain to you what I mean by this before going into the details, I invite you just to follow your imagination what it might be. In general, a road movie is about somebody who is leaving beaten paths and explores new perspectives. And surprisingly, this can also happen within molecules. I'm based in Montreal, which is a beautiful city in summer. It, uh, it also very nice in winter, even though it can be kind of challenging, but this kind of challenge also makes us experts in looking for treasures that might be hidden behind big backgrounds. And this is also what today's talk is about. So it's a movie, therefore you will see the storyboard here. <clears throat> Don't take the timing too seriously, and if you have any questions in between, feel free to, to also interrupt me while it's going on. So I will start by talking about how to extract signals that are hidden in a background, similar to the needle in the haystack uh, idea, just we cannot simply burn the haystack to get the needle, we have to find other ways how to, to get it out. I will then talk about techniques, how to film any molecular dynamics before we go to a, let's say, conventional molecular movie of a coherent signal. And then I will finally come to roaming, the phenomenon I'm going to investigate for a longer time. You might know this term from uh, when you're traveling abroad and receive suddenly very huge uh, bills on your mobile phone, but actually it is really happening in nature as well. And then I will show you the related molecular road movie for, of this statistical roaming signal. So you, yeah, of course, there's always the question, why do we need movies? Isn't it enough just to do a measurement at the beginning and the end of something similar to the initial and the final state? And of course, in many cases, this already gives you a lot of information, but you also, if you have seen the presentation by Steve Leone, he told you the example of Margaret uh, filming the galloping horse. And let me show you here the, Canadian answer, which Dwayne Miller once brought to my attention about why movies really show many things that are otherwise hidden. So far so good. We still have the impression from the initial state, but now see what is happening. There's already Nanook of the North coming out of his kayak. There's Ali. And now, One more person behind, the baby additionally hidden in there. And another person on the other side. And the dog. So even though the movie I'm going to show you soon won't be as spectacular as this one, and I'm sure this one was also very hard to film about 100 years ago, we are facing different challenges in filming molecules that are undergoing a chemical reaction because molecules are so small and so fast. So if we look at characteristic scales, the characteristic length scale, 
involved here. I mean, humans, we are used to something like the meter scale. We are very familiar with this one. And if we look at the distance, we know kilometers very well, megameters as size of the earth, gigameters for the sun. And then we can go towards the smaller site. That's a ticks on the order of millimeters or the famous coronavirus that is preventing me from being with you in person right now, but still being in Montreal while presenting my talk. Um, it's on the order of like micrometerish. But then if we want to look at molecules, we need to approach nanometers and even smaller. We can even go down to picometers if we're interested in the nuclei, but we will stay here below the nanometer angstrom scale for the information I'm interested in here. This alone is not so difficult, but in order to make a movie, we need to combine this with the characteristic time scale of such a reaction. And this is really adding the challenge here. Since again, if we go through the scale, the one second is what we know very well, heartbeats and so on. Then longer scales are also easy to, to digest in terms of kilo or mega seconds for days, hours, like hours, days, uh, months, years, lifetimes typically are around giga seconds, depending Halloween is approaching. So for some it's longer than for others, but let's say about gigaseconds. And then the age of the universe would be like petaseconds. But if you go the same direction, actually, uh, sorry, the same order of magnitudes, but in the other direction, this is where we need to get in order to really attract molecular dynamics. So a simple flash like in an electronic camera, uh, sorry, like in a, in a conventional camera would only bring you to milliseconds. And this is what we use in conventional photography if we want to freeze any fast motion in order to see it in a sharp way and not blurred. Chemical reactions happen on microsecond scales. Electronics are able to handle nanoseconds, but here we really need to get down to pico and even femtoseconds to track molecular motions like vibrations or rotations. And we could go even shorter using attoseconds for electron motion, but this is not what today's talk is about. So I, I will stay here below, like between femto and picosecond temporal resolution combined with, let's say, angstrom spatial resolution. That's where I need to go. So how can I actually film then a chemical reaction if just a conventional optical or electron microscope cannot do it since I cannot simply combine it with a conventional flash? For us, the most important tool to do this are femtosecond laser pulses. And in 2018, Donna Strickland and Gérard Moreau were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for actually making this tool possible. Because previously, just to have a femtosecond laser pulse, this problem was solved, but the question was how to get it intense. Because in order to amplify it, you need to add more and more photons to it. But whenever they did it, the nonlinear crystal used for amplification would just blow up. So they needed to find a way how to store more energy in the pulse without destroying the medium where they do this. And whenever you have a very short pulse in time, this would relate to a very broad energy and due to a Fourier transformation. So they took advantage of using a combination of gratings to stretch the pulse in time. And now they had access to these different colors or different frequencies at different times. And they could amplify it basically one after the other, getting the amplified long pulse. And then the only thing left was to use again a grating pair to recompress the pulse. And that's how they achieved the high intensity, very short, very strong pulses. And such kind of pulses have been used by Ahmed Sewail, who was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1999 for a topic called femtochemistry and the pump probe technique he was developing. Because as I mentioned before, you cannot simply use any electronic flash or anything. We, we simply have available to freeze such, mo such, such motions in order to get a clear picture of what is happening. But if you apply such kind of pump probe technique, it actually does not matter if your detector is very slow, as long as you are able to create any kind of ultra-fast event that induces a unique signal. And then you have all the time until the next laser pulse arrives, which can be a millisecond afterwards. So you have a lot of time to collect all this information related to a specific motion that is happening within the molecule. So if we look at the scheme here and 
on the x-axis, we see the internuclear distance, so the distance between these two atoms within a molecule. And we use one laser pulse, a pump pulse, to excite this molecule. So we go to another electronically excited state. We superimpose a bunch of, let's say, vibrational states and create a wave packet. And now, according to the motion of these atoms within the molecule, this wave packet would move from one side to the other. So this itself, we cannot directly see. But now, if we add a second ultra-short pulse, a probe pulse, this can act like an elevator, so it can transport population from here to any higher lying electronic state. And from there, laser induced fluorescence can be observed. Fluorescence itself is something very slowly, like nanoseconds. So we could not see any time result fluorescence directly from the B state. But since we are looking from up here, and this fluorescence is only present whenever the wave packet is entering this probe window, so I can detect. This fluorescence, I see a time resolved signal while the molecule is propagating when I change the time delay between the pump and probe pulse. And the distance between these two maxima would then correspond to the vibrational period I'm interested in. In a kind of simulation, this wave packet dynamics would look to what we see here. So I'm exciting from the ground state up to the first excited state, and this wave packet is swinging back and forth along the potential corresponding to the motion of the atoms, and then we see such kind of a coherent oscillation as expected. And I'm using a simulation from Professor Markus Bühl from the University of Potsdam in Germany here. So this, sorry, this principle, I'm just jumping too fast, I'm trying to go back. Yeah, this principle is working because the motion I'm triggering with this femtosecond pulse is a coherent motion, which means I can excite it on one molecule and I use the next laser pulse, I excite it on another molecule and it will follow exactly the same motion. So let's say 10 femtoseconds after the arrival of my pulse, the atom is here, later on here, 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 and it goes back and all molecules would behave the same way. So I can repeat the experiment many, many times and like this get enough signal in order to really investigate it. And because of this, we can now start to also play around with it. So I spent my PhD time looking at a system bromine in argon. So basically using a bromine molecule and um, embedding it in a rare gas matrix. So I had frozen argon, it was really cold, like a few Kelvin, but then you can freeze argon, it will build a crystal structure and you can embed gas phase molecules in there, which then are kind of trapped in a prison. So they, they can try to shake the bars, they can no longer rotate, they cannot run away, they cannot translate anywhere, they can stay in there, they can vibrate and might interact with the with a cage like this. But it's actually a very interesting many body test system. And if I apply such kind of pump probe experiment, because of the energetically broad femtosecond pulses, I would always excite more than one electronic state, in this case, two at the same time, which follow different motion because the potentials look different. So I was interested by this B state motion, but Unfortunately, the A state was super dominant. So if I look at this kind of time resolved trace that I'd mentioned before, which looked super symmetric in this easy case, here it's a very complicated combination of these two structures. And this A peak is very dominant. And the one I was actually interested in, the B peak down here, is super tiny. So I was wondering how I could enhance this signal to make it more, like, to make it more clearly visible. And if I use a single short laser pulse, this is like an impulsive excitation. So basically the, everything is excited at the same time. It, doesn't, it, it can be sufficient, but it doesn't allow much selectivity. However, if I come with a coherent excitation, which can be very soft, but it has to be periodic, and the frequency has to match the resonance frequency of my system. And in this case, it can be extremely efficient and I can make a selective choice and can even learn more about the, um, the actual system involved due to this resonant frequency information. 
and yeah, here that was the the video from the collapse of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, where exactly such a situation happened when periodic winds were were coming. So I took advantage of such kind of a scheme, and looking at the excitation spectrum of this bromine in argon, there is a huge background, which corresponds to this A electronic state. And there are only very tiny peaks on top of it. They correspond to this B structure, which I would like to, to enhance. And now this gray curve below here would correspond to this impulsive excitation. So I would mostly excite background and nothing else. However, if I would manage to get an excitation spectrum, or like an, if my excitation pulse looks like the red train or these red spikes you see below here, I can now selectively excite these B peaks and not the background in between. So like this, I can actively control what is happening and um, yeah, make a selective choice here. And the way how this is done is using a so-called 4F setup. So I do an optical Fourier transformation. I go from the time domain towards the frequency domain. In there, I have now access to the different um, frequencies. And I can apply, for example, a mask to select specific um, components. And now I do the back transformation. And instead of a single pulse, I have now a pulse train. And um, with this, I'm able to really selectively um, excite the B state and not the A state. And the corresponding spectrum is what you can see here. So the A part is now very suppressed while B is actually the dominating one. So with such a kind of coherent excitation with the pulse train, I was able to generate constructive interference with every single new pulse that is coming in there. And of course, I did the test experiment also shifting this whole spectrum such that no B contribution is excited. And in this case, um, also there's no um, contribution from the B state and only this A background would be visible. So this is not yet a molecular movie, but it shows the control of a chemical reaction to enhance a weak coherent signal over an incoherent background. But what happens now if it's if I'm interested in not a coherent signal, but statistical molecular dynamics? So in this case, every molecule would do its own business, basically. So at a given time delay, one would look like this, the other one would look like this, the other one like this. So I cannot repeat the experiment from one laser shot to the other. And how in this case is it then possible to detect a time resolved signal since if everything just accumulates, you would only end up with a mess. So, and then how could I select the specific dynamics, even if it's statistically from a background, even if it's an overwhelming background. So it's basically the transition between a molecular movie versus a molecular road movie. And this can be compared to imaging planets where we know exactly where and when to find them compared to imaging shooting stars, which can be basically anytime, anywhere, and really fast at the same time. So what we need to extract a statistical dynamics, and even if it's hidden under or behind an overwhelming background, is a detection method that is sensitive to single molecules and that allows to extract information from every single molecule individually and not only the average value. And as I will show you, Coulomb explosion imaging is capable of doing so. So what we need for this is the combination of strong laser pulses and Coulomb explosion imaging. And um, if you want to see a very dramatic <laughs> explanation of this, I invite you to check on YouTube the Molecular Road movie. So that's a, a small animated video I made uh, about this whole roaming process. 
But if you check on Wikipedia, you will find that Coulombic explosions are a mechanism for transforming energy in intense electromagnetic fields into atomic motion and are thus useful for controlled destruction of relatively robust molecules. So you, you will, during this talk, you will not only see like destroyed bridges, you will also see destroyed molecules. Um, the way Coulomb explosion imaging works is you combine these two laser pulses, pump and probe. The first one, the pump pulse shown in, in purple here is the one initiating the dynamics I'm going to study. And the probe pulse, the red one is the one who is responsible for blowing up the molecule once it's meeting them here on the molecular beam that is superimposed to the tube. And what happens once the probe pulse enters is that several of the electrons of these molecules are almost instantaneously stripped off and the positively charged remainders of the molecule now Coulomb explode. And this is happening very fast and positively charged fragments will then be guided by a bunch of electrodes towards a time and uh, position sensitive detector. And using classical mechanics, out of this space and time information, I can reconstruct the 3D momentum vectors. And once I have this information, I can see it. So basically all these different momentum informations are summed up. And once I find pairs or combinations of fragments whose momentum sum sums up to zero, I know that these fragments must have originated from the same molecule. So I can reconstruct structural information from the moment of explosion. And that's the, the tool I'm using in the following now. The experimental chamber looks like this. So here in the back is the laser I'm using for the excitation. Then there are some kind of frequency conversions happening. And the laser is entering here from the front. These two laser beams I need for such kind of pump probe experiment. And down here at the chamber is the gas manifold. So I can mix all kinds of gases that I'm interested to investigate. And they are brought up to the chamber here and I create an ultrasonic cold gas jet. And in this chamber here, these two are reacting with each other. And then down at the bottom, there are the electrodes. And these are on the, on the right, you see the rack with all the electronics that are required to maintain the vacuum that is needed, the high voltage and all the, the infrastructure around basically. So a couple of years ago, um, in all, we took a, what I would call conventional molecular movie of the proton migration in the acetylene cation using this kind of Coulomb explosion chamber. So this proton migration would basically correspond to this planet image I was using before, because what happens is acetylene is a linear molecule as depicted up here, HCCH. And upon excitation with the laser pulse, one of these protons can start to walk on the other side to build vanillidine, which you see at the bottom here. And it can actually also go back and forth. So we start with a red curve here with 100% acetylene, that's the initial state. And then after about 100 femtoseconds, we reach the maximum of vanillidine production. And so far this part was known, but luckily we made the movie and we learned that it does not stay here, but it really swings back to the acetylene side and yeah, continues uh, for a while. And we also understood this motion thanks to the calculation of Michael Scorman from the NRC in Ottawa, which is just next door. So this was kind of the preparation for, yeah, how to make molecular movies using Coulomb explosion imaging. But then we went further on and wanted to see what happens um, if we are looking into formaldehyde where this actual roaming motion is, is happening. So basically formaldehyde um, consists of H2, C and O. And when you're investigating these unimolecular dissociation reactions, there are two conventional dissociation channels, which means um, they are following the minimum energy path. So it's straightforward. Um, the system is looking for situations which are the easiest one to, uh, to follow. And in this case, 
um, there's either the molecular dissociation shown in, in green here, in which case <clears throat> one barrier needs to be overcome and then a new chemical bond is formed. So we end up with the molecular products H2 and CO. Or in the other case, the radical dissociation channel shown here <clears throat> is where basically one bond is stretched and stretched and stretched until it breaks. And in both cases, these fragments are just departing and uh, yeah, never see the, the parent fragment again. <clears throat> However, in 2004, there was a science publication by the group of Joe Baumann and co-workers where they found that in the case of formaldehyde, there's actually another motion in which this departing proton behaves more like a, like a teenager. So instead of fully departing, it, it rests as a different, at a difference of, let's say, distance, sorry, of a few angstrom and actually encircles the parents. There's all kind of random motion, but it does not fully depart until a while. And then at one point, it even grabs the second proton and both of them are leaving together. So this motion was termed roaming. And actually it starts similar to the radical dissociation. So the bond is stretched, but then instead of directly leaving, this um, yeah, actual roaming motion is happening. And here on the right side, you see one example of such a trajectory where one of these protons is now encircling at different times this remaining fragment here. So it's, yeah, actually corresponding to a kind of hindered dissociation, so it cannot directly run away. And the way how it was observed was in either theory and then also in high resolution spectroscopy analysis. Because looking at H2 vibrational and CO rotational levels, they found a different pattern that did not match the molecular dissociation, which would just show up in this area. There was actually another contribution which they could not explain, with, which corresponded to rotationally cold CO fragments, but highly vibrationally excited H2 fragments, and was not going over this uh, transition, this traditional transition state. And um, yeah, this dynamics was expected to, or was seen to happen on the hundreds of femtosecond to picosecond uh, timescales in theory, but there was no time resolved investigation of this. And actually, well, roaming is not only a phenomenon that occurs in the lab, but it really happens in real life. So it is present on Earth and in space as well. It is, for example, um, involved in the production of acid rain, since uh, in the chemical reaction that you see down here, at one point, roaming NO2 fragments can easier combine with water leading to acid water. Um, and like this, I mean, there, there was this huge field of, of uh, research opening in the 1980s, 90s, when everywhere on, on Earth it was observed that uh, all the, the forests are suffering from this. And because of this, many of the <clears throat> pollution uh, rules have been changed. Now we have other problems, <laughs> but okay, that's a different story. Um, but because of roaming, this process was shown to be so efficient because it can happen at energies earlier than what was expected just from transition um, state theories. Or also uh, looking at the formation of trihydrogen, the other example here, that is you know, also very, very, very abundantly present in, uh, in space. Um, the group of Marcus Dantes has shown that H3 plus can be formed due to roaming H2 fragments. <clears throat> so in general, roaming involves large amplitude motion far from the equilibrium geometry bypassing the traditional constraint transition state. And it is of almost general nature since it does not only occur in, in formaldehyde or the other molecules I've shown you. There's also acetaldehyde, methanol, and there are really a lot of molecules where this was shown to happen. And it's also not only the light proton that can do this roaming motion, it can really be a lot of different fragments. But in generally, it is observed in high resolution spectroscopy only indirectly due to product outcomes. And in terms of time resolved measurements, there are a few explorations, including the one I mentioned before regarding the trihydrogen formation. 
But all these examples have in common that they do not involve any direct observation of roamers. They are time dependent signals, which are related to roaming, but they do not directly show the actual roaming fragment. And this is what, what we have been aiming for. So imaging roaming dynamics and formaldehyde is quite challenging. One topic is, as we discussed, how to image a statistical process. But then there's also the fact that this ultrafast dynamics is extending from femtosecond to nanosecond time scale. So if you go back to this scale I've shown you before, there are really many, many order of magnitudes involved. And you need to have the resolution to see this fast event, but you need to wait for a long time. It's like if you're sitting outside uh, on a summer night and you want to see the shooting star and you don't know that the only shooting star of the night will arrive at 1, 15 and 23 seconds <laughs> exactly. And you're waiting the whole night to see it's happening. And then you even don't know where you have to look at this specific moment. So that's kind of the situation we have been facing here. So before we started the experiment, <clears throat> it was known that a pump pulse in the UV, in our case, it's 304 nanometer, is exciting a molecule from the ground state to the first excited state, creating population there. And this population is then relaxing to the hot vibrational ground state as indicated by these arrows here. And this relaxation was known to take tens of nanoseconds. And then once we have reached the hot vibrational ground state, <clears throat> first the molecule would start to vibrate, H2 vibrations. And then the actual roaming motion might start in which now the proton is encircling the remainder. And this again takes like tens of femtoseconds to picoseconds. And at one point then H2 is formed and both of them are leaving the remaining fragment together. And we decided to look at this in a pump probe experiment. So basically we were using a strong near infrared laser pulse to blow up the molecule to collect the fragments. Um, and this we did at different time delays. And basically it means like we are probing this dissociation reaction anywhere in between. But the challenge here is that even though the order of all these steps is fixed, the onset and the duration of each of them is statistical. And we cannot follow a single molecule all along its way. We just get a snapshot of one situation and then it's over. <laughs> But nevertheless, we didn't worry too much. We put formaldehyde in the chamber and look what happened. And for experimental reasons, we used deuterated formaldehyde simply because in the chamber, we also always have some water background, <clears throat> which would then at the moment of Coulomb explosion give us H2 or H plus fragments, um, which were hard to separate from the actual H2. The O fragment signal. So that's why we decided let's go to deuterated formaldehyde. And in this case, it's a unique signal we are looking at. And then here you see measurements for the two body breakup. So we are detecting D2 plus fragments and CO plus fragments in a time of flight spectrum. We can select these two. And then again, we look for momentum sums of zero to know that they have origina originated from the same molecule. And now, when these two fragments are very close to each other, at the moment of Coulomb explosion, they would release a very high kinetic energy. So in this case, the total kinetic energy here is about six EV. <clears throat> and we see here the spectra for different pump probe time delays. And there's another peak, which is well understood here at the bottom, in which case these two fragments are very far apart from each other. And like this, there's only a little bit of kinetic energy they can release. But the question was, what is happening in between here? We have another peak that remains as, at its position, but increases with increasing time delay. And this does not correspond to just a dissociation, because we had seen this before in the case of acetylene, the coherent uh, molecular movie I've shown you before. In this case, dissociation occurs, but this basically corresponds to a continuous stretching of the bond, so, which means when I probe this, the peak is just walking towards smaller and smaller kinetic energies with increasing time delay. But this is not what is happening here. The peak remains at the same position. So we were hoping that this could somehow be related to roaming. But um, one of the problems was it was occurring extremely fast already at 100, 200 femtoseconds, we saw this peak growing. 
and as I mentioned before, from um, nanosecond excitations, it was known that the lifetime on the X state, or, uh, sorry, on the on the A state, was 53 nanoseconds. And here we are talking about 100 femtoseconds. So there are a couple of orders of magnitude in between, which made our life very complicated for a long time. Because then on top of these 53 nanoseconds, of course, there's the statistical roaming process happening on the order of hundreds of femtoseconds to picosecond and the dissociation process as well, which can last up to 50 picoseconds. So for a couple of years, we cross-checked all other possible excitation mechanisms just to, to understand what was going on. Like, is there any direct excitation of the hot ground state? No, there's not. Or is there any other vibration on the a state maybe that could lead to similar dynamics? No, there is not. Is there any hidden crossing between the A state and the X state at the energies we are using? No, neither. And then on the other side, we also look for evidence that we are indeed populating the A state using our 304 nanometer pulses. So we looked for laser induced fluorescence and it looked exactly as expected. We looked for photoelectron experiments and it looked good. So we had all kind of evidence that we are indeed performing the experiment we had planned to, but it was just five orders of magnitude too fast. So throughout um, this whole project, I, I kind of kept an army of theoreticians busy <laughs> helping me to understand the experiment. And um, the first group working on it was Michael Skorman's team from the NRC in Ottawa, the National Research Council. And they studied the photoelectric photo excitation from the ground state to the first excited state and the subsequent non-radiative decay back to the hot ground state using quantum dynamics. And then once we're on the hot ground state, Paul Houston from Cornell University used semi-classical molecular dynamics trajectory calculations to study the dissociation and roaming dynamics happening on the hot ground state. And then the third group, Joel Bauman's team from Emory University was looking at how to project these trajectories from the hot ground state to a realistic D2CO3 plus potential energy surface to simulate the probe step, the experimental probe step. Since we do not see what is happening on the A state, we really need to bring it up to the E3 plus state in order to have something comparable. And if you're interested by details about this theory, I invite you to look into the supplementary materials so you will find all of them explained in detail there. So after a long time, Michael Foreman and Simon Neville came up with a solution why we were able to observe populations so quickly. The reason is there is indeed a tiny population transfer happening already at two picoseconds, 5% population, but some population is transferred already at these times. The majority comes after, but Responsible for this are different coupling mechanisms, which are not directly obvious. And here we also have to keep in mind, we're using a femtosecond laser pulse that is broad in energy compared to just a very narrow band nanosecond laser pulse. So this is also helping us out here. And you might think that 5% is not much, but now it's a question of, of sensitivity of the detection mechanism. And if you find a unique observable and can be able to eliminate the background, 5% can be indeed enough. And you can compare this to like a leaking tap on top of a, of a bathtub. So if your detector is like, let's say your foot, once you're walking in the bathroom and you only recognize the water once the whole floor is, is wet, then you indeed have to wait for a long time until the whole bathtub is filled up and the water is actually leaving it. But if your detector is like your hand and you can directly place it under the tap, then you are able to detect the first drop coming out of the water tap. And that's corresponding to the situation we have here. And this helped us. So once we had this uh, calculations, we could uh, confirm that indeed what we are seeing can be roaming. And now we had to prove that it really is roaming. Um, and uh, to give you an idea how these different motions look like, let me just show you two uh, different trajectories. And I'm using this mountain panorama here just to give you an idea of this direct dissociation path along the minimum 
energy. And here you see one of the animated trajectories where we see first the vibrations of this H2CO molecule. And now the movie doesn't continue. Okay, I hope it will eventually. I'm not sure what you saw. So in my case, I missed the actual dissociation. I hope it's all right. But so at one point, one of the protons um, is leaving. And this is different from the actual roaming trajectory, in which case, yeah, really this roaming fragment is exploring the potential energy landscape and um, actually now roams around the remaining fragments. And yeah, it's hanging again in my case. I guess it's hopeless to repeat it. It will just happen again. But I invite you to, to look at the, again, the um, supplementary material of the science paper or also this YouTube video on the molecular roaming channel. I meant uh, roaming molecular road movie, I'm sorry, I mentioned earlier. And there we even have them animated with some music. So I find it quite, quite neat. Um, to give you an idea, how um, this actual roaming motion looks like, and, and for example, and, and especially what's the variety of motions that can be observed here. You see an example of different trajectories from this publication of Paul Houston here. And in this case, they are so-called short trajectories, short roaming trajectories. So we are looking at the azimuthal angle between the H and CO plane on the x-axis and the distance between one of the protons and the CO on the y-axis. And we see that in these short trajectories, there's a lot of vibration happening first. And then at one point, quickly, this one proton roams around and already leaves and is gone here. However, in these long trajectories on the right side, you see that it can really encircle the parent ion for a long, long, long time in all kinds of angles and motions until it's finally leaving. So this gives you an idea about the complexity and really the variety of motions that every single molecule can undergo. But luckily, in, um, when we have the trajectories available, we can follow one single molecule along the whole path, something we cannot do in experiment, but we can learn from these trajectories. So here you see the time axis, and then on the y <clears throat> axis, we have the distance between one of the deuterons and CO, and then we have these two curves, blue and red, corresponding to the two different protons. First, they are both together with the CO. And then at one point, one of them departs, roams around, but comes back. And then both of them are leaving together. So this would correspond to the classical idea of roaming. After return, what the second um, deuteron is abstracted and both of them are leaving together. So this green area is identified as roaming. From here on, we are talking about dissociation. But while we, are, we were analyzing all our trajectories, we also figured out that not all of these trajectories are following this uh, known pattern, because there are also some that do the roaming, but afterwards only one of them is leaving. So it follows this radical dissociation path. And that was something unknown previously because nobody was looking at them in this time resolved uh, why, yes, we did here. <clears throat> and there are really a lot of different motions possible. Um, we see here on the left side, left column, all possible molecular dissociation. On the right column, all possible radical dissociations. The upper two pictures are without roaming. The lower two are with roaming. So whenever you see this kind of bump, it corresponds to the roaming motion followed by dissociation. But between roaming and dissociation, there can be a long time, like this yellow curve here, for example, there are always almost two picoseconds between roaming and the actual dissociation. So <clears throat> it, it really makes a lot of sense to look at it in a, in a time-resolved way. But now we had to find a way how to do so. And um, what we did basically was to identify gates in real space from these 1,500 trajectories that we had to look for different patterns for these different 
um, pathways we want to separate. So roaming, D2 like molecular dissociation and radical dissociation here. And these plots you see correspond to real space representation where the CO fragment would be located at the bottom. One of the deuterons is along the x-axis and the other one can move around within these um, semicircle basically. And then the roaming pathway would correspond to such kind of narrow half ring. Molecular dissociation would show up along this line here when both of them are leaving together. And the radical dissociation basically would use up the whole geometrical space in this kind of representation. <clears throat> and you immediately can also see one of the challenges because every fragment that follows the radical dissociation path has to go through this roaming. There's no way because it's it's just on the way. So we do not expect to have observables that are 100% separated, but at least we were aiming to identify distinct areas for the distinct uh, dissociation channels. And the experimental observable we came up with using the simulations of Joe Bauman's group is the angle between the two deuteron momenta versus the kinetic energy release, the total kinetic energy release of the fragments. And now if I compare these three different channels, roaming, molecular dissociation, and radical dissociation, as well as the equilibrium position where all these fragments are very close together, I see indeed very different patterns linked to these different channels. In case of equilibrium, the fragments are most closely together. So at the moment of explosion, I can see the highest kinetic energy release. And then in the case of radical dissociation, it would lead to a much lower kinetic energy release since the fragments are well separated already. So with this, you're prepared to see the actual molecular road movie. Again, an animated version is in this YouTube video. Here I show you the individual pictures. So here's just for repetition, again, the, um, the simulated assignment. And now I can link this with the experimental data. So this orange ellipse corresponds to the equilibrium position at the highest kinetic energy. Down here, this purple ellipse corresponds to the radical dissociation. And in between, we have molecular, we have roaming in red and molecular dissociation in blue. So these two areas, appear at the same kinetic energy release, but at different angles, luckily. So we still have means to separate them. And now if we look at the different time delays, 0 fm to second, 200, 300, and so on, we see that with increasing time delay, there is more and more population growing in this roaming area. So as I mentioned, we cannot follow a single molecule with this technique, but we can see that Already at 200 femtoseconds, there are a bunch of molecules undergoing roaming, and we, we catch them on the fly. So why they're actually following this motion. We don't know for a particular molecule how it continues after, since we blew it up. But we know the statistical ensemble, how it's behaving. Um, so all these relative positions are well identified. And we also understand the energy offset between simulations um, let's say simulations here and the experiment due to experimental reasons. Um, but still, of course, we wanted to be really sure that what we are seeing here is indeed roaming and not anything else. So we looked at the ratios of these different branching, the, the different branching ratios between roaming, molecular dissociation, and radical dissociation from the trajectory sim simulations. We were expecting something like 9% of roaming, 34% molecular dissociation, and 57 radical. Well, if I'm comparing the values here, it looks like there's much more roaming than this tiny bit of molecular dissociation. So this gave us another hard time for a moment. But the fact is these trajectory simulations are happening on the hot ground state, while the experiment is on the three plus. So there's this whole strong field interaction with the propulse in between, and this can change things quite a bit, especially um, because we need to ionize our system in order to get here. And there is a phenomenon that is called enhanced ionization in which 
atoms that are at a distance or like fragments that are at a distance of a few angstroms can be ionized much, much more efficiently than at any other distance. And this is what we believe is actually also happening here. And so the experiment is actually in favor of roaming because roaming fragments are exactly in this enhanced ionization regime. And that helped us a lot. But just to be sure, we analyzed the data also from another perspective, which is the angular distribution between these two um, D2, uh, this D momentum vectors. And we looked at this at different time delays. And actually that's what, what is plotted up here. So we analyzed all these trajectories and um, in within this red kinetic energy range that is indicated here. And indeed, also from all these angle distributions, which we then compared here to the experiment, we see that there is really much more roaming happening within this kinetic energy release than anything else. So we concluded that within this area, we see about 70% roaming, 29% radical dissociation, and only 1% of molecular dissociation. So molecular dissociation doesn't worry us at all. And because it's so, so tiny compared to the roaming fragments and for the radical dissociation, we were expecting contributions simply because every fragment that is about to dissociate along this channel has to pass through the roaming area. So we have no, <laughs> no way to distinguish this. But we were quite happy with this proof that yeah, it is indeed the aroma that we, we have been seeing here. And yeah, so with this, I like to basically summarize this roaming work where it we succeeded in directly observing the different unimolecular reactions in the ground state of formaldehyde, the conventional dissociation pathways and this fairly new roaming pathways. And along the way, we were able to generalize the definition of roaming to include both dissociation towards molecular, but also radical channels. And this was possible because we are now able to look a transient roaming signal. So not only waiting at the finish line and see whether somebody with a flag of roaming appears or not, but really looking along the way how things are happening. And uh, this is possible because of the single molecule sensitivity of Coulomb explosion imaging. And then we saw or we learned that the onset of roaming occurs several orders of magnitude earlier than expected because the onset of the L to X transition is already at the hundreds of femtoseconds rather than nanosecond time scale. And what I like about this, it's really a perspective for detecting roaming dynamics in particular, but also to see weak statistical dynamics hidden maybe behind some kind of background in general. And this is a very important aspect because many phenomena in, in biology and life happen on a statistical way and not in a coherent motion way. So this opens a perspective here. And then, of course, there is no, uh, no film without a film crew. So um, Tomoyuki Endo is the postdoc who was leading these experiments in Oz at the laser lab. Then there's Paul Houston here who uh, was providing the trajectory simulations. Joel Bauman, whose team provided the potential energy surface of the three plus state and helped for the simulation of the, um, the actual probe step. The team of Michael Scorman for the relaxation dynamics and uh, Francois Ligari, who is the director of ALS and yeah, he supported this whole project tremendously along its way. And of course, the actual star, I mean, is this formaldehyde molecule, of course. Um, and uh, yeah, these are the different production places and financial support. So many thanks to all the contributions here. And if you would like to learn more about ALS, I invite you to check the website, ALS INRSCA down here. There's also on YouTube. A, a video which was made for APS so spring meeting where the infrastructure is introduced a little bit. So if you're curious, you're very welcome to see this one as well. And uh, yeah, with this, I thank you for your attention. <laughs>